Tibetan Book of the Dead for me is a very therapeutic tool if understood correctly. That's the challenge. There's so many layers to it. It's super hard to understand correctly. And applying it therapeutically? No way. Now, Buddha and a lot of his teachings require a whole lot of intensive focus over a long period of time in order to understand, understand this stuff correctly. And you don't need to understand that. I, what I'm going to do is just show you the stuff you need to understand. That's it. And it's really elegant and it's beautiful. Uh, works perfectly and it works for here and there. And that's an important feature of this too. It works for now and later, which is to say after you die. Now, the actual book is called The Bardo Thodol, which is a Sanskrit phrase. Bardo is transition and Thodol is liberation. So in essence, this is the, it's a transition, your afterlife is a transition for you where you have an opportunity for liberation. And the opportunity for liberation is always available to you. It is right now. And it's available then. And we're going to go through the whole Tibetan Book of the Dead. And I'll lay out all the different details that are relevant for you. But one of the concepts that's very, very valuable is liberation is always available to you. It, there's this certain intense periods of time where it becomes more available, which is something that it actually starts out with. So it was written 1,500 years ago by Buddhist monk some monks, and they hid it for about 700 years, which is interesting. If you think in terms of some Buddhist philosophy of detachment and trying not to take credit for things, it's really sort of a Jesus thing too, no man shall boast. They wrote it, and then they buried it. You know why they buried it? They didn't think people were ready for it. It was too deep, too much, too complicated. They're like, mm, people aren't ready for it now. So we'll hide it, and their thinking was that it'll surface whenever it needs to. So they weren't interested in, man, we just wrote a great book. We need to take credit. It was, I'm completely fine. We'll throw this out there, and whenever people need to come across it, uh, they'll come across it. I would suggest that's the exact same case for you right now. See, we're going to go through it, and it's coming up for you right now, right when you're ready to hear it. It's also true for anybody else, perhaps on the Internet, that watches this, or anytime you come across it, then it's the right timing for it. So that was their philosophy, and it works. And so we're here today to go through all that. My experience with it was it's actually fairly shortly after 9-11 that I decided to read it, and it made no sense to me whatsoever. Put it away for a while, and a couple years later I tried it again. It still didn't make any sense, right? Could barely get into a couple pages of it. Then I got into this line of work, and I saw the need for it a lot more, a lot of people dealing with tragic loss and death, and I tried it again. It started to make a little bit of sense, and then in the last several years when this stuff started to click and I started to write my own book, uh, then it really started to click, and then I had a couple breakthrough experiences with it, and then it made real lot, a whole lot of sense. So now when I read it, I know what to look for, and again, I'll give you the, some of the clues as to what to look for about it. So 1,500 years ago, it, it surfaced actually about 700 years ago, and now it's available to all of us now. The uh, Swiss psych psychologist Carl Jung says, this book reveals the secrets of the soul. He, he actually wrote a foreword for it. In, I think this 1920s, an American editor translated it from the, the uh, Sanskrit language into, into English, and he's the one that named it the Tibetan Book of the Dead. Okay, that's the original name. He calls it the Tibetan Book of the Dead. And he had Carl Jung write a, uh, a foreword for it, and he said, this book reveals the secrets of the soul. By the end of today, I'm going to go through some of those secrets of the soul for you. Now, it starts off like this. You're going to see, because if you've gone through this whole group series or read the book New Eyes, um, so much of the stuff is in there. And uh, so it pulls it all together. The first paragraph of, of the Bardo Total. O God, boundless light of reality, O loving, faith, o loving and fierce celestial beings, angels and guides, O great spiritual teachers and saints, I acknowledge the oneness of the infinite potential. I acknowledge the oneness of the infinite potential. That's entanglement and superposition at the same time. It's a boundless light of reality. Everything is energy and we're vessels of light. It's all there. And it starts off with acknowledging this. Upon death, you're going to find that there's a, a boundless, limitless, infinite potential reality going on. Now, that's present for you right now. You just might not be aware of it. But over there, it becomes more clear. They say the bardo of of the dying process, your mind becomes nine times more clear than it is now. I don't know where nine comes from, but also know it's a lot. Much more clear than it is now, and yet there's still a lot of growth to go. So there's a lot of uh, some similarities between what we talk about here and what goes on there. 
Now this thing, this big circle I drew, is called samsara. Who's heard that word before? Anybody? You. From me? Yeah, okay. So <laughs> what's it mean? The wheel, of life. the wheel, yes, it means the wheel. So this is a big wheel that I drew. When I spoke it into my phone, once in a talk texting I said samsara, the phone heard samsara, which is perfect, because that's really what it means. Some sorrow, although the book would probably emphasize a lot of sorrow, okay, but it's a good way to think of it. Some sorrow. It's a wheel, and it's a wheel that we're all stuck in, if you will. And you're going to be in it for eternity unless you figure out how to get out of it. This is the, the process of reincarnation, which we're going to go through. The whole process is, is involved that you're going to go round and round this wheel until you figure a way out. And it's the same way for everybody which is sort of an important feature, we all got to figure our way out. And if you don't get out of it, you're going to keep going through sorrow again and again and again. So it's an important feature to recognize the sorrows involved. Now, I've got a little section down here. This is the physical life section. It's where we are right now. It's a teeny little spot. It's relevant, not for this book, but it's relevant to us right now. Uh, you're going to go through some sorrow here. This is Buddha's first noble truth. Life is suffering. You're going to go through some sorrow, right? Well, book starts with the expectation that here you will have died, right? That's coming. Anybody, any, anybody has surprised to hear that? <laughs> You're going to be dying at some point. There's about four different phases that I'm going to go through with you today, primary phases or bardos, of, as part of this wheel. And the first phase is, um, well, they're all interesting, but the first one is very striking and very dramatic and very important. Uh, at, the, at the moment that you die, or in the very few first few moments after you die, there's an opportunity for immediate liberation. That's because there's a spot, if you will, in this samsara, where this great white light appears. Now, if you've heard about people going through death, near-death experiences, you know, they sometimes say they see a light. Well, 1,500 years ago, that's what the Buddhists, the Buddhists were talking about, too. There's a great white light. They call it luminosity, or a ground luminosity. What it actually is, is the, your essence, it's the nature of mind, it's actually you. But if you didn't spend your time during your life learning to recognize that, because you spent time during your life thinking that you're physical, this is where ego comes in. If you think you're a physical being and you're all the isms, right, and if you think, you know, I'm a white American male living in Pittsburgh kind of thing, and that's what I am, and that's what it's about, I'm not going to recognize this white light. And it's an important distinction, because it's... it's given to you immediately right there. I've heard it described as a flash of lightning. How fast does that go by? Right? If you don't know to recognize this, it goes by like a flash of lightning. And now you're going to go through the rest of the wheel. Okay? But if you recognize this as what you are, or as what the book describes, the self-liberating luminosity of your own mind. Self-liberating. Why self-liberating? Who liberates you? So. Just you, right? You've done it. You've earned it. And by the way, 7 billion people on earth right now, who does this apply to? All 7 billion, okay? It's why it's fair. Every single person has to learn how to recognize the nature of their own mind. It's self-liberating luminosity. And as you wake up, and as you start to wake up and have, a, have this luminous experience, the white light becomes obvious. First of all, you feel it inside of you, and then you'll know to recognize it. I've also heard it described as... If somebody goes to shake your hand and you don't think it's a friendly person, you may not shake its hand or, her, or his or her hand. But if, you, if it's a welcome person that, you, that you're looking forward to seeing, you'll not only shake their hand, you'll give them a big hug. That's what this white light needs to be for you. You need to recognize it. You need to know it. You need to feel its peace. And you need to run into that light. If not, like a flash of lightning, it's going to go right by you. And the hand shake gets, and the hand gets pulled away from you. And then you'll miss it. What the Book of the Dead does is it's teaching you what to expect, and it's also while you're here, it's going to be something we're going to talk about later, how to operate while you're here, but also what to expect later. Wake up. Now that's a good way to start this, because which Buddhist word means wake up? Buddha. Buddha, right. The word itself means wake up. Wake up, and why is it telling you to wake up? Because you're asleep, right? Wake up. I have transitioned from physical life through bodily death to the point of spiritual awakening. Okay? Trans you're making a transition. This is the bardo. It's a transition. From this point on, I will awaken my spirit and my consciousness by contemplating the infinite potential of the spirit. 
I must meditate on peace and harmony and love and compassion. For the sake of all beings and all realities, I must remain centered in the oneness of the infinite potential. Once again, that's entanglement. We're all connected for the sake of all beings. If I do it, I help you. If you do it, you help me. We don't get out until we all get out. It's the basic idea. That's why all the prophets were working on this kind of stuff together. It's an important distinction. I am connected to you. You're connected to me. I'm doing this for the sake of all beings, just as you are. Within this experience of infinite oneness, I will attain the supreme peace and harmony of the infinite potential, and I will accomplish the purpose of all beings. Because we're all going to get there. Very valuable. We're all going to wake up, and I want to do it so I know how to help you do it, and vice versa. That's the point. And I'm not going to be satisfied until you've done it, and you're not going to be satisfied until I've done it. So we'll keep going round and round this wheel. If I do not attain the supreme peace and harmony, then at the least, while I reside in the spiritual reality, I will recognize that I am residing within the spiritual reality. It's a nice way of being a little merciful, which is to say, if you don't figure it out, no big deal, at least you know you didn't figure it out, and now you're in a game somehow, right? It's sort of cool because you know, it takes some of the pressure off. Because it probably sounds like a lot if I say to you, you better recognize this light, this luminosity. If you don't recognize it, boom, you're doomed for more sorrow. Believe me, they emphasize that enough throughout here. But if you feel that pressure, guess what? You're more likely to miss it. No pressure. Just recognize the light when it comes to you. It's self-liberating luminosity. It will rise before you, and if you recognize it, you are liberated. Dozens of times throughout the text it says that phrase. Recognition is liberation. I want you to memorize that. Recognition is liberation. Recognition and liberation are simultaneous. The whole point of the mind is to recognize the truth of what you are. That's it. There's nothing else that needs to be done. We're down here working on the, in the flesh world. We're working on all of these things, trying to earn salvation, right? trying to please God or whatever it is. And yet all you needed to do, just like it says in Christian texts, is to, is to have the faith and to trust and to know what you are. That's it. No man shall boast. Same thing here. You're not going to do anything here. You're not even going to do anything here. Recognition is all you need to do which is basically, I am the white light. By the way, we're going to get into this in a second, but there's a bunch of different colors, and there's a bunch of different types, types of white light. Bright lights, soft lights, that kind of stuff. This one is radiant and warm and inviting, but it's really intense. It's pretty similar to the sun. Most of us like the feeling of sunlight, but it's pretty hard to look straight into, right? A good metaphor. At any time that you have the recognition, liberation is yours. There's just more moments, there's more opportunities where there's more intense moments where you can figure it out. And when it's presented to you, when it arises right in front of you, recognize it. But then it's going to go hide again, if you will. Just like we go back and forth, I'm sure, in our own lives of moments of insight, and then we go fall back into the swamp of delusion, and then we have insight again, okay? Does it really hide, or do we just set up a barrier? Well, because like we I said, to to it seems like it's hiding. You wait till you see the way this, this ends. It's beautiful. Because, yeah, of course it's not hiding. It's right here, right now. It's right in front of your face. But you think it's hiding. That's the way it appears. Uh -huh. oh. This is what's known as nirvana or heaven or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, you've escaped the wheel. That's it. And you can do that right now. Do you get confused as to where your home is currently? <laughs> no. Okay, it's the same thing. <laughs> not yet. Not yet. <laughs> years. When, when you recognize this is your home, what would you do? You walk straight into it. So it's like that. And then there is no need to come back, and yet you might choose to. There's plenty of text written about this text, of course, but the, the idea is, well, I call it tenure. Once you've done that, you got it. That's, what, that's the point. That's liberation. You melt into the universe. What happens next? I don't know. I, I'm not out of it. I'm talking to you guys, right? So the, the fact is we're supposed to get there, and then question mark. I don't know what happens. Next. All I know is I want to get there. Okay? I think of it as a really good party. Let's meet over there. Okay? Otherwise, we're going to have to do all the rest of this. It's like being lost in the woods. So you don't have to proceed, although you might choose to, but now you have some free will as opposed to what's being forced upon you. The fact is, you're going to keep going until you have recognition, until you are liberated. It's, it's Psalm 23. You are being forced to lie down in green pastures and by still waters. You're being forced to recognize heaven. You're going to. Like Kabbalah says the same thing. It's the path of pain or the path of light. This is the path of light. It's a straight shot. Recognize it. Spend time while you're here figuring it out. You're not the ego. You are the light. And once you come across the light, which, by the way, is also known as logical and it's therapeutic, how do you, how's the light feel? What's that? Warm. Warm. What else? Peaceful. Peaceful. 
And so therapeutically, when you're feeling warm and peaceful, that's because you're in the right place. And if you're not, it's because you're not recognizing it. You're in an ego place. And that's always consistent, always true, all the time for everybody. So if you fail to recognize that this is you, the luminosity is you, it continues. The path continues. And you move into this place where what gets presented to you are what's called peaceful deities. I spelled deity right. I spell it right? Close enough. Deities. Peaceful deities. Now nah, it's probably I-E. Yeah, right. Um... No big deal. So I'm not clinging to specific spellings of things. It's all good. I've released it. Peaceful deities. That comes next. And the peaceful deities, the book actually describes experiences of, of like seeing rainbows and stuffed animals. It actually says stuffed animals and like, you know, you're going to see what's described as all random imagery from your former life. Okay? Random inner imagery starts showing up. And it starts out as peaceful, which is to say pretty pleasant. And if you're experiencing something pretty pleasant, are you thinking of it as external or internal to you? Like say you're watching a, a movie that you like or watching your child play or something like that. You're thinking your kid's over there and you're not thinking that this is coming from my own mind somehow. But it's what you have to do. You have to recognize this as a projection. If you fail to recognize this as a projection, you have to continue to go on. But you see peaceful things, pleasant things. In the Course of Miracles, it talks about how you've got to watch out for the good things that happen to you because they're going to keep you stuck just as much as the bad things. You have to recognize that what you're experiencing in the peaceful deities aren't actually occurring. They're dreams, they're manifestations, they're coming from your own mind. And it's a pleasant experience, which is nice to have a pleasant experience. <clears throat> but if you don't recognize that you're dreaming it because you're still asleep, then the wheel continues. Now, this can be challenging because how many people are trying to wake themselves up when things are good? To me, this is the absolute essence of Jesus saying, blessed are the persecuted, okay? Because when things are pleasant, you're not like trying to look at it differently. You just experience it. This is great. So you're saying <laughs> you are the light once you recognize it. Correct. You've it. melted into it. That, now, you've, now you've got what nirvana is. You become it. And it's what you are. It's, you know, being born again. All that kind of stuff. The, the issue and why it's drawn like this and why they explain it like this is because of yin-yang and relativity. People are on different levels. If I explained it to people like you just said, they'd be like, wait a minute, you mean I'm already there? I don't need to do anything or whatever. <clears throat> the fact is it's a process of growth, and this is how we learn, by recognizing phases, you know, the bardos. It's literally transitions. We go from being a second grader to a third grader. You go from thinking that you're this, I'm white American male, to thinking, well, I'm not really a white American male. I'm having a white American male experience. And in the current culture, the mindset of our current culture, we've got all these people arguing and hating on each other, and yet it's all relative. Shift roles, come back, and it's probably what happens to most people. If you, if you keep hating other, you're coming back as other, and you're going to have a completely different experience. It's the process, because people who are hating on others are clearly not liberated, are they? They're not seeing white light. It doesn't look particularly peaceful to me. So it's a process, second grade, third grade, fourth grade. It's a process of letting go of something you've been clinging to when you were younger, perhaps, letting it go. Forgiveness takes care of that fairly well. And then there's a process of going, wait a minute, I'm not even a body? This isn't me? You know, in the Christian teachings that we're children of God? Well, it's not this, it's not the body, it's the soul aspect. It's one of the secrets, as Carl Jung would talk about too, is you're not what you think you are. The entire wheel, all of samsara, all of the sorrow, if you will, is set up to create pain so that you can let go of the false self, which is what the ego is. That's the point. So it's a process. Yes, it's always available to you. Just like sunlight is always available to you, but sort of comes and goes based upon the time of day. But it's always there. So if you fail to recognize the peaceful deities are projections from your own mind, you move into the phase which is called wrathful deities. This time I'll spell it right. Wrathful deities. And the same beings, deities are just higher beings, uh, energy beings, if you will, that are starting out as peaceful, they become wrathful. Which is to say they're aggressive, and they become sort of angry and scary. Let me read some of this to you. At this time, when your spirit and body have parted ways, <clears throat> pure reality manifests in subtle, dazzling visions. 
vividly experienced, okay? You're in a movie theater. You're like in a cosmic movie theater, excellent 3D, you know, high def, right? And, and, and they're movies, they're, present, they're being passed before your eyes, if you will. And some people have described, gee, my life passes before my eyes. Yes, random imagery from your former life start appearing. And they're intense and they're vivid and they're dazzling and they're frightening and they're worrisome and they shimmer like a mirage on the desert. I think of this, and I do want to do this Disney World. I want to do a Bardo Dodal ride, right? How great would that be? You know, the 15-hour wait it takes to get to the ride. It explains the whole book. And then you get on the ride, and sure enough, all these images start passing before your eyes. And they're not, they're, they seem to be scary, but none of them can hurt you. It says that at some point in here. It doesn't matter if you get cut into pieces, none of them can hurt you. Because nothing, nothing can hurt the soul. It can only hurt the ego or it can hurt the body, which you aren't. Do not be terrified. Do not panic. You now have what is called an instinctual spiritual body, not a material flesh and blood body. Thus, whatever sounds, lights, and rays may come at you, they cannot harm you. You cannot die. It is enough for you to recognize these experiences as a manifestation of your own mind. At some points, they describe that 50 murderers will be chasing you. Okay? And you're going to be freaked out. You're like, this is totally scary. It's like a dream state. What else is like a dream state? This, this <laughs> life right here. Okay, It's a dream state. It's not actually happening. It's going to freak you out, and you're going to think you're dying, and yet you're not. Remember, this is red. I should have said this earlier. This can be studied now so that when it comes to you, you're not shocked by it. You're like expecting it. If you, have you ever gone to a horror movie? And when the knife comes out and the person gets stabbed, are you shocked? What is this horrible imagery on the screen? No. Do you feel a little bit of fear? Sure. But do you know it's a movie? Sure. Well, the preparation for this stuff is to come when you recognize, because once you know you're a soul that can't be hurt, you'll watch all this imagery. You'll be like, whatever. No big deal. And if you get really good at it while you're here, you might even be nailed to a cross, and you might be able to just sort of take it, because you know you're not getting hurt. Now, that's understanding of, of, of true self. That's liberation from ego. So, at the time, at this time, the great red wind of evolution will drive you from behind, fiercely, unbearingly, terrifyingly. Do not be afraid of it. It is your own hallucination. A frightening, thick darkness draws you from the form, irresistibly. You are terrified by harsh cries such as strike, kill. Do not be afraid of them. Heavy sinners will see cannibal ogres brandishing many weapons, shouting war cries, kill, kill, and strike, strike. If you read the Bhagavad Gita, it sounds just like that, okay? That the nature of reality turns out to be all this scary, evil stuff. Don't be afraid of it. Again, similar to what we're doing down here. A whole bunch of chaos is happening in the world. Are you experiencing it in a terrifying way? Or can you see it from a detached point of view and recognize what it is? You'll have a different experience of it as a result. You will be hunted by troops and blizzards and storms and fogs. You will hear sounds of avalanches and floodwaters, forest fires and hurricanes. In panic, you will escape by any means. So can you imagine? Does this sound like fun? <laughs> when you're going through, man, it's just the movie, and you'll be running around, and because you're terrified, what do you look for? Remember, you don't have a body. Escape. Yeah, <laughs> I want out. Now, if I'm in a movie theater and it's freaking me out, what do I do? In the Book of the Dead, all these lights and all these colors, there's so many doors you can escape from, and each one of them is a direct path into a rebirth. And it gives tons of advice. Don't go to the red light. Don't go to the blue light. Don't go to the green light. And it says stuff like, uh, this is the wisdom light, or that's the anger light. You know, It's all the colors that we're used to here. And it says, if, if they appear at any point, let's use color, once you start to see these lights showing up, it warns you, don't go there. Because what's your job? What are you supposed to be looking for? Which light? The light Yeah. You start picking one of these colors, next thing you know, you're, you're headed for rebirth. Now, you can go get reborn as many times as you like. Right? The Bible even says in Revelations, if you're looking back at the country from which you came, you'll have a chance to return. Straight up to me, a direct, like you said, with purgatory. It's the same sort of thing. You got a chance to come back. You can dive right into, right into one of those lights if you want, okay? And if you're terrified because of all this, go ahead, escape. You don't, you don't get to escape the wheel until you are fully liberated by recognizing the true nature of self, right? <clears throat> In panic, you will escape any means, only to stop short of the brink of falling down a yawning triple abyss, red, black, white, bottomless, and horrifying, hey, immortal one. 
Okay, he's trying to gently remind you, you're immortal, you cannot die. You who was called Scott, it literally has a blank. Because you can read this to a person who has died. Scott just dies, I'm saying to him, hey Scott, don't forget, you're immortal, don't be afraid. It is not really an abyss. It is your own lust, hate, and delusion. See, if you don't resolve what's inside your head here, you're not going to recognize the luminosity. You're going to see the peaceful deities, oh, this is pleasant, I like this, this is not, oh man, this is scary stuff, I hate this. And you didn't realize you dreamt all of it. You're not recognizing, coming from your mind, coming from your mind, you don't recognize it. It's your own issues, if you will. Your own resentments, your own fears, your own impatience, you know, all the negative virtues, if you will. They have to be fully eliminated in order to, to create the white light. Buddhism has the word for it, it's called Dzogchen, which is actually the great perfection. And it means you need to be purely in the white light and not just temporarily, it comes and goes. So if you have an experience of it, like, like an insight, when you have an insight, how does it feel? Ah, that's like a little piece of the white light. But perfection is when you're completely, now remember, I like to say this, which religion has the word perfection in it as its goal? All of them, okay? And yet we get taught, no, you don't have to be perfect. Just believe your prophet was and you're good to go. No, no, no. Even Jesus said, you must be perfect as your Father in Heaven is perfect. You might get a little piece of the light and you'll feel it for a moment, but it's elusive. Because you got some bugs to work out. I compare it to trying to lose weight. You want to lose 70 pounds. You lose 35. You're halfway there. That's pretty good, right? But you're not done yet. It feels good, though. Lose another 20 pounds, you're getting close. So you got to get all, rid of all that 70 pounds in order for you to be good. You want to be the perfect, pure white light at all times. And that means you're able to go about in any circumstance. You're going to stay peaceful. It's called equanimity, Buddha says it. It doesn't matter what happens to you. You'll be in, in touch with the light. Jesus says if your eye is single, your body will be filled with light. I mean, you can see the teachings are parallel. Okay? He says if you can stay focused, and this, this emphasizes again and again and again, stay focused, this will fill you. So how about this, Beth? If I said to you, you're a cup, you're a vessel of light, and you're only one-third filled with the light, you still got two-thirds more to go. But if I can get more light, now I'm halfway. That feels better. You're going to keep going until you are perfect, perfectly filled with the light. And that means you have complete awareness that you're not this and that you're totally this. And that's the point. This is going to emphasize that. Because if you don't do it now, which is the point of being here, is to recognize that you're not this, that you're this is the soul. This will surely emphasize it as well, because you're not going to like this. How many times do you want to do this? Yes, because if you're able to resist, because it says the word resist a lot too, the intoxicating pull from like the soft blue light or whatever, and you're like, I'm not going to go there. To me, again, to read this correctly is to recognize what the Kabbalists or in Judaism would call mitzvah or the other, um, the, the temptations of the mind, things that are competing with the white light. How many things on earth take your mind off the idea that you're supposed to be working on your spiritual development? Hey, look, there's a cheeseburger. Oh, look, some drugs. Hey, a football game's on. You know, every time, those are just other lights, and they're intoxicating, and they pull you in. Resist that temptation. See spirit all the time. Okay, so let's say you, <laughs> you didn't do, weren't able to do the work that you needed to do, or you didn't choose to do the work that you needed to do while you were alive. Wherever you reach the point of recognition, do you automatically become the light, or do you have to do that additional work? Recognition and liberation are simultaneous. Okay. You can do it here, there, 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 anywhere, okay? There's just moments, like in our personal life. Are you guys more likely to become um, liberated or enlightened in this office when we're talking about this stuff, or when you're watching a football game? Think about it. If you're actually studying, like Buddha would say, you're reading Dharma, you know, you're studying the spiritual teachings, are you more likely to have an insight? Or what if you're reading Fifty Shades of Grey? <laughs> now, of course, there's, it's superposition. There's probabilities. You can increase the probability of winning this game now What by the Sangha. I mean, this emphasizes the three jewels all throughout. Dharma, Sangha, Buddha. Got to keep emphasizing that. Each one of you has Buddha in you. All these answers are already in you. It's a process of, of unfolding. It'll come about. You'll eventually get there. If you focus, it'll come about quicker. That's Buddha. Um, Dharma is the teachings, and this is the very last line of this. If you've got to work on the teachings, if you study the teachings, it'll come about. You'll eliminate. The wrathful deities won't even scare you, just like they won't hear. You won't see this as bad anymore. 
It is literally overcoming death. Uh, to me, that is LeBron James, Michael Jordan, uh, Steph Curry. You know, pick your basketball favorite basketball player who's in the zone, right? And when they're in the zone, they can't miss. They're clicking on all levels. They, it's an awesome feeling. It's not the complete feeling, but it's a little piece of it. When you feel love, when you feel inspired by something beautiful, yeah, that's a little piece of it too. But that awareness needs to be expanded into all of it. All of it. And recognize you're only having those experiences way back from the book. The observer effect, you're a conscious being. You're a conscious being having an experience. You're interacting with this thing called samsara. And what keeps popping up for you is exactly what you need to pop up for you. And the person to your left or your right, what's popping up for them is what needs to pop up for them. And it's an opportunity for anybody. The more adverse circumstances, often, the more likely you're going to say, I need to look at this different. You get sucked into the peaceful, beautiful part of it, then you're not going to be liberated. What happens upon your death? Good luck when you come back around. If things went great, went great for you, you got your millions of dollars, and you got your mansion, you got love, and all this great stuff, you're going to be miserable over here, because you're going to literally be walking around looking for your stuff. And if what you do is look back, like this line here, when you come across your surviving relatives, and they perform incorrect religious rites, which is to say, imagine somebody who's on this side, who's mourning your death. And they're upset, and they're trying to pray you into heaven, or you know whatever the case may be. And you're having experiences of them. And it's not correct, if you said, it says imperfect religious rites. You must think, well, my perception is certainly imperfect. I see these as a result of my own negative attitude, like seeing the mirror's faults in my own form. Which is to say, no, 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 you're the one that's looking at them incorrectly. It's another example of the mirror. Wherever you go, whoever you see, whatever you do, it's a reflection of your own mind. You have to embrace it to the 100, 100 degrees, 100%. That's perfection. And then you now own all of it, you've taken all of it, and you don't have to go back around and around and around again. Not until you get to 100% will this act, will this be complete. Now this is the this is why over in the East, Far East, they have... They have um, they're all dedicated to the reincarnation idea because I know this is a long process. The purpose of this little phase here, which is physical reality, is because it speeds things up. We have a chance to actually interact with each other. This part that we're coming to next, if you fail to recognize this as a projection of your own being, you start to begin the rebirth process or the becoming process because you look for a way out. I don't know what to do. I'm scared of all this stuff. Uh, you know, it's creepy to me. I need out. I must need a body again. You immediately start to cling. I need to be flesh again. And so literally the body starts to form energetically around you because this is a really high vibrating frequency, if you will. And you're still attracted to the flesh place. You can't let it go. And since you can't let it go, the body starts to form again. You quite literally start to get as it says, you start to develop sight, sound, hearing, all that kind of stuff again. And yet you don't have a body. What you do have, which is crazy, you have evolutionary magic powers. This means that you, you have no special abilities, because everybody has this, but you have magic powers and you can, in a split second, circle the planet. You can move through mountains. Anywhere you want to go, just reach out your arm and you're there, okay? Because you're, you're a ghost. It's called a hungry ghost. You, you haven't figured it out yet, but you're floating around and what you're desperate for, you're craving human contact, or, you know, I need a hug again, or whatever, and you're not used to, and you're not aware that you can be completely filled with this. It's always there, completely fulfilled, and you're not satisfied, so now you're, you're coming back into the earth realm, and now you see all these places and all these things, and you're like, yeah, this is great, except for it's not, because you're invisible. Magic powers? Well, yeah, if you just took, if you detach yourself from your body, you know, in a dream, you could do billions of things inside your own dream state. That's what happens here. You'll be able to shoot through the world, and then you're going to still be unsatisfied. You're going to say, well, great, I was able to go to the moon and back in the speed of light, but well, what's that really do for me? What happens here? Their spirit guides are all throughout this, just like their guides here. You know, we really have each other. And if you learn to look at the other person as your teacher, it's always the case. All of you are teaching me where I'm at in my development. All of us are teaching Beth. All of us are teaching Chris. And all the way through, through it, whether you know it or not, the world is your mirror. Now, some, some people can be aware of it, some not, but it never stops. It's always teaching all spirit guides. What's well, also the case up here. 
the beings, the ascended ones, the ones in the white light, higher dimensional beings, you might say Jesus the Lord, Buddha the Lord. There's millions of, of Buddhas that they mention, not millions, dozens, that they mention throughout this. They're always con contacting you. They're trying to guide you. I like to think of them as fans in the stands cheering you on. They're trying to get you to wake up, but you need to be able to do it, and all they can do is try to influence you. Okay. So to your question, those guides at this phase, if, if you fail to recognize and you have not awakened, or as the book says, being extremely stupid, <laughs> because <laughs> it is sort of good. How many people down here are, are so filled with animosity and resentment, once again, you can think politics if it works for you, that they destroy themselves based upon their hate of other? Well, that's extremely stupid, isn't it? When this express goal of all this is to learn how to see other, love thy enemy. That's what it is. That's how you break free. That's how you get liberated. But go ahead, get consumed with hate. Well, you know, that's why this is fair. If you do, then that's on you. So you get to the state, you've not learned nothing, not learned anything, and you get yourself to a point where you're like, I need a body again. This is where the forces, the powers that be, that spirit guides, including yourself, because you have a say in this, start to develop this pathway back to your rebirth. This is the phase where, what's the right circumstances for my birth? How do I get out of this mess? Now you start to go back into this, they call it, you start to re-enter the womb. And it says you still have a chance to close the womb door. It even says, you're, you're going to see a man and a woman coupling. And you're going to like go, ooh, there's a chance for a body. It says resist. Because why? You still have a chance to get to the white light. You still have a chance for, lumino uh, for luminosity, for recognition, for liberation. You still have a chance. It, it says the whole time, just keep, stay awake, stay awake, try to wake up. If, it, if you fail to do it, now this is where your tendencies come into play. The whole thing is an energy system. This soul, if, if it's resentful here, it's resentful here, it's resentful here, it's going to end up taking on circumstances that will bring about its possibility for correction. So, what are some life circumstances that might actually help a person who's got resentment issues? Are they going to be born in an environment which is really easy and they have no reason to resent anybody ever again? No, they're going to specifically get, get the annoying next door neighbor so they can work on that issue because they need to learn how to recognize, no, I'm projecting that. I needed to have that experience. If it's, again, I, the, the, that says this in here somewhere, I, if I can get to the end of this, the advice. Um, the best thing to do is remember the virtues. What are the virtues? Forgiveness. Courage. Patience. Courage, compassion, yeah, wisdom, uh, creativity, you know, go on and on, hope, all that stuff. If you remember that, you can apply that here while you're alive. Because do, do those things work? Absolutely. And it, do they work here? Do they work here? Do they work here? They absolutely work. Remember the virtues. And then you're energetically, you're going to be better off. If you find yourself getting pulled back into the physical realm, don't, it says, do not go, ooh, that's a good life, or oh, that's a bad life. Don't do that. Accept either one that's coming to you. That's going to help balance you out. The whole key is to get back into a, a physical life, which is going to be the right circumstances for your opportunity to wake up again. And then you're going to get about 80 years, give or take, and you're going to have a chance to go through it all again here. And if not, you're going to swing back all the way around again. Okay, so I have to get to some of these. Oh, this is how it ends. It does say stuff like this. As you begin to gain access to a womb, choose wisely, but do not judge anything as good or bad. Oh, that would be great. I'm going to be born in, in Pittsburgh where they got that good football team. Yay, you know. Or I'm going to be born to millionaires. Mm. No, that's not the point. You have to go, which of these circumstances is going to help me wake up? Guides will be suggesting, go there, go there. It literally says, which continent are you going to be born on? Choose wisely. Again and again, it says that. So, I mean, there really isn't a good and a bad life or circumstances for anyone. It's what they're going to learn from where, I mean, it's all good because you're going to learn from what you're experiencing. Yeah. Excellent. That's called the tree of life. The Bible itself, do not eat off the tree of good and evil, eat off the tree of life. Buddha says there's no good or bad, there's just peace and not peace. If you can see every one of your life experiences as neither good nor bad, as did this bring about peace or not, now you're accessing the light. If you pull that off, now you're balanced. That's dog chen, that's equanimity, it's all those things, that's perfection. And that's the goal. So you don't, wouldn't evaluate as good or bad. You could say, 
Well, that was pleasant or not. You could do that. And I prefer, I say this again and again, I prefer pepperoni on my pizza. Some other people might prefer, um, you know, vegetables. <laughs> do either one of them matter? No, not to the white light. If you can see the spirit in it, then you'll gain access to it. You still might have experiences of good or bad, but those are decidedly ego things. Here, now we're at the end of the book. I will give up corpse-like like sleeping in delusion and mindfully enter unwavering the experience of physical reality. So I'm not going to go back like a corpse. I've been a corpse the whole time. Let me not go back as a corpse. Sleeping in delusion. Again, the vast majority of the world is in ego mode. Asleep. Robotic thinking. Not aware. They think they're flesh. We're arguing about all this physical stuff. That's what all the wars are about. Whose profit is correct? Who needs the money? You know, where, who, who should have that piece of land? All of it, delusion, all of it being projected from every individual person's mind. I will give up this corpse-like like sleeping. Conscious of dreaming, I will enjoy the changes as clear light. When I come back in, that's what we were just saying. Good or bad, I'll enjoy it as the light. Either way. I said, is that what you want me to experience, God? You want me to experience this? Think Jesus on the cross. Did he want to go do that? Not my will, thy will be done. No, he didn't want to go do that. He knew he needed to, and he saw it as the light. doesn't matter what happens to you. In fact, if you can see a bad thing as the light, you're going to wake up much quicker. This vessel will get filled a lot quicker. If you could take a bad thing and see it as the light, get really filled up. Not sleeping mindlessly like an animal. I will cherish the practice. Merging sleep and realization. I love it. Now that you're coming back into the physical form, you're going to merge sleep and realization. That's, this is give to Caesar that which is Caesar's, give to God that which is God's. You're going to come back in with the awareness that, yeah, I'm in this sleep-like state. I'm in a dream, but I'm also self-actualized, and I realize this. I can now walk through this physical world as a spiritual being. It ends, the last line, if you do not put the Dharma in your mind, will you not be the one who deceives yourself? The Dharma is the teachings. The Dharma is the truth. The Dharma is like everything we're just talking about. And if you don't put that into your mind as you, re as you take on another physical form, aren't you just deceiving yourself? Well, the answer is decidedly yes. If you don't wake up to the process, you're going to spend not only this life, but all this, blaming the external. And you get to go through it again and again and again. All right, so here are some of the secrets. Per important way to think of it, because you can apply it here and there. It's all a projection all the time. In the book, we have the thing called the projector. It's also the observer effect. It's always a projection. The movie reel is inside your own brain, and you, through your eyes, are the light sort of looking out through the movie. That happens here. That happens here. If you see it that way, it'll happen here. It'll happen here. It's always just a projection. Therefore, it's all just an illusion. Chapter 13. All the smartest physicists have called an illusion. All of the prophets called an illusion, and Jesus demonstrated that's an illusion. And yet, we think it's real. If you can't get yourself to a place where you recognize that this is an illusion, you're not liberated. Does that make you bad? No. You're still in some sorrow, and you're going to keep going through sorrow. But when you do wake up and recognize, wait a minute, this isn't what I think it is. I'm a spiritual being having a physical experience. That's liberation. You still have the experience, but you do it with the light, which, you know, I like to say is very therapeutic. Now you're peaceful, and if you go to die, you're going to be like, ah, I'm not really dying, I'm just leaving the movie theater. That's greatly therapeutic. You can get through all of your issues by recognizing this. It's just an illusion. You had an experience, let it go. Who among us is, is going to go through this phase? <laughs> you know, every single person. And you're going to be glad you worked on the Dharma. Okay, you're going to be glad you worked on this stuff. You're going to be like, oh, I remember Steve was talking about that white light back in 2017. All right, I should look for it probably. Yeah, that's a good idea. Look for it while you're here. Whatever you con concentrate upon will come about. This is in the book. Whatever you concentrate upon comes about. That's why focus is important. If you worry a lot, stuff that uh, is going to worry you is going to come about. And if you're resentful, stuff that is resenting will happen to you. If you forgive, then you're going to have a forgiveness experience. It's whatever you choose to focus on, and it's not the other person. Direct quote, you have a mental body of unconscious tendencies. If you are killed and cut into pieces, you cannot die. You're a mental body of unconscious tendencies. That is superposition. Okay? You have all these probabilities, or what degree of forgiveness are you? What degree of patience are you? The physical aspect really is just the tool. Course in Miracles would talk about it that way too. Use the flesh to teach the spirit. Okay? 
get off of the idea that you're a body. You turn your own projections into demons. You've done it. You need to love thy enemy. And a few helpful lines, and then we're done. Unless you read, these are all from the book. Unless you recognize that everything is illusion, you will continually fall into the eternal swamp of suffering. This is 1,500 years old teaching. Unless you recognize this is an illusion, you will continually fall into this. There will come a point where you recognize it as an illusion. Listen without distraction, it says in again and again and again. Without distraction. How many of us get distracted in our physical lives? Every time you turn around, oh, there's something physical to do, you know? Or I'll be like, hey, Steelers are playing, and I just lost it again. Now I'm mad at Tom Brady again or whatever. I just got distracted. Stay focused on this. It's always there. If your eye is single, your whole body will be filled with light. If you see projections as enemies, you will not become Buddha. If these projections, which is all of it, if you see them as enemies, you will not become Buddha. So think of the recent political events again, too. If you see other as enemy, you will not become Buddha. You're going to have to somehow learn how to see that other person as a projection of your own mind. At every moment, remember the practice of virtue. You must stay focused. It says that again and again. Stay focused. If you're walking a tightrope, and if you lose focus, you're falling off. Three more. Practice in this life is most important. Practice is most important. This is Hebb's Law. Practice makes perfect. If you don't practice this stuff, you're not going to be good at it. You want to practice patience? Go to Walmart and go to the longest line at the checkout counter. Okay. Next time you're in traffic, let a couple people in front of you. Right. This is why compassion and um, charity and those things can be very helpful. Because if you're practicing giving up some of your ego possessions, that can be very valuable. Got to practice this stuff. When I suffer, may the Lord of great compassion be my guide. Who does that sound like? When I'm suffering, may the Lord of great compassion be my guide. That means here, 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 or here. Who's the Lord of great compassion? Name your favorite prophet. Right? The light, God, Jesus, Krishna, Buddha, Muhammad, whatever. Um, the Lord is my shepherd. Doesn't matter which religion you're in, it's the same thing. Those are ascended beings. Those are the deities, okay? Those are the ones from above who are trying to get you to wake up and realize what they've realized. Their process. They got out. They're just leaders. They're the shepherds trying to teach you how to get out, all of them. And if you can remember, oh, that's right, that Jesus, that Buddha, that Krishna, Muhammad, whatever works for you, that's important. Whatever works for you, man, you're connected to the light. And it works when you do it, right? You can feel that. What happens to your suffering? Whether you're here, 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 and you manage to connect to the light. Diminishes, right? And Buddha would say, last line, and Buddha would say, and that is the proof that this is what's true. As Ram Das says, for those who have had this experience, no explanation is necessary. For those who haven't had the experience, no explanation is possible. Right? The fact is, when you start to experience that, you know it's true. If not, keep going through the, the peace and the wrath and the peace and the wrath and the rebirth, and you'll eventually get there. 